Good evening, Sedge Garden family and those watching from afar. Good to see you tonight on this uh, Wednesday evening, midweek. We are coming back together tonight to uh, worship the Lord together around His Word and to pray for each other. And um, just was looking at our bulletin from this past week, just a couple reminders for you. Uh, of course, we're still doing our live stream on Wednesdays like this, and then Sunday morning we're actually meeting face-to-face -face here in the building. Hope to see some of you soon. Uh, no rush or anything. I mean, if you're, if you're really concerned about being exposed to others, I certainly understand that. Uh, but we're trying to make it as safe as possible here with the, the pews all cordoned off and we're cleaning everything abundantly every week. And so hopefully you'll be able to come back soon. In fact, this coming Sunday, we'll be uh, celebrating the Lord's Supper together. We won't be uh, actually passing it out. We will uh, be using a special cup that actually has the uh, fruit of the vine and the, and the bread in one thing and you'll just grab it when you come in the door uh, and so i hope that you'll plan to come if you can on this sunday at 11 a.m uh, also some happy birthdays are in order we want to wish happy birthday to krista russo hotch and also donna huey having birthdays this week Happy birthday to you, happy birthday to you, happy birthday, God bless you, happy birthday to you. And we also have some prayer requests tonight, uh, some good news. I heard from Sister Donna this week about her surgery. It went very well, and she shared something that just blessed my heart. She said that, you know, so many people were praying for me, and I've always had anxiety about surgeries and things like that, but she said she had the peace of God that passed all understanding during this whole ordeal. We're thankful that the, the doctor uh, is convinced he got all the cancer cells and that she'll be going back in a week or so to see the oncologist to find out about what, uh, what treatments she'll have in the future. So please continue to pray for Sister Donna Huey. Also, let's remember our missionary, Joel Johnson, in Brazil. He's there for a couple weeks, and we want to pray that God gives him a wonderful uh, open door to communicate the gospel by way of the wordless bracelets, and also they have a super ministry together, actually giving food to those in Brazil who are hungry, truly hungry, and so pray that God will bless that outreach as well and bring him home safely to his family and to us. Um, also, we want to pray for Word of Life Poland. Uh, I guess I have a special reason for saying that because uh, my sweet girl is there in Poland. That's where she's living now, serving at Word of Life Poland. And uh, they are beginning camp, or they began camp this week, discipleship camp. For the first camp this season and uh, i suppose things are going well i haven't heard from her that means that she's been very busy but just continue to pray for the ministry there as they reach young people for the glory of god also we want to be praying for little skylar's grandmother uh, who has been very ill uh, we want to pray that she would become stronger and be able to come out of the uh, situation that she's in god knows all the details there and I'm sure you have a request as well. So we want to bow our heads together at the beginning here and just pray and just uh, bring these things before the Lord and know that he, he understands all the details. He knows the needs even more than we do. And so let's just pray together and take it to the Lord. All right, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you today and we thank you and we praise you that we have the privilege because of our great high priest in heaven, Jesus, to come boldly before the throne of grace. And you promised that if we do, we'll receive mercy when we go there. We come today in the name of our Savior. We thank you and praise you, Lord, for all the blessings that we enjoy simply because we're in the family of God. Lord, we thank you for the wisdom on high that we can have if we're students of your word, if we spend time with you every day, how that you can lead us and guide us in this life. 
uh, and, and help us, Lord, to have wisdom beyond our years. Tonight we pray, especially, Lord, for these on our prayer list. We want to continue to lift up Sister Donna as she's receiving treatment for the cancer. I pray, God, that you might please strengthen her body, that it might fight off this invader, and that you would have, uh, she would have complete healing. And I know, Lord, because I know Donna, that she'll give you all the glory for that. And I pray also for Billy, her husband, that you might strengthen him as well as he is uh, walking alongside of her during these difficult days. Give him wisdom and strength as well. We do pray tonight for Brother Joel there in Brazil. Uh, Father Joel is, is always busy about your work. I know that as soon as he hit the ground, he started running for you. And I just pray you bless him now and use him in a mighty way there in Brazil as he ministers to his own people in the same area that he lived for so many years. We also pray, Lord, tonight for Skylar's grandmother. You know the exact needs that she has physically. I pray that you might heal her uh, physical problems because you are the great physician. There's nothing that you can't do. Lord, I pray for other needs that you're aware of that I'm not aware of. Uh, needs that our church family has and needs that folks that are watching by way of the live stream tonight have. I pray, God, that you might just intercede and meet those needs according to your perfect will. Lord, I, I'm, I'm thankful that when we pray generally, the Holy Spirit prays specifically and knows the exact needs. And I pray that tonight that you would have your will accomplished in each of our lives uh, Lord, we pray for those that are in harm's way because of the coronavirus. Uh, Lord, I pray continually for those health care workers and first responders that uh, come into contact each and every day. I pray for their, their protection, and I pray that you would even use them as ministering angels to those who are suffering. Lord, we pray for our law enforcement uh, who are under great attack today for simply doing their job. I pray, God, that you might please protect them, that they might know that, uh, that there are some folks that do appreciate what they do. Uh, Lord, I pray that you might be the leaders of our country today. I pray for our president. Lord, while he's not the most perfect person in the world, none of us are. He's in a position that probably none of us would want. I pray you give him wisdom, Lord, that, that he might make decisions, wise decisions for the people of America. And I pray for those senators and, and uh, those uh, governors of states and those mayors over cities that you might give them a compassionate heart for the people that they represent. I pray that you might use the system that we have. While it isn't a perfect system, I pray that you would use the systems that are in place to meet the needs of, of people. Because, God, I know that you love people. Your heart is open to people. And I pray most importantly that they might hear the good news that Jesus died on the cross so that their souls could be saved and their sins could be forgiven. Tonight we come and we celebrate the life we have in Christ together. We pray together right now. You know our hearts. You know the needs of our families. Lord, I pray you might be with each one who's listening today. Uh, bless the home that they represent. Provide every need that they have. And Lord, help us to be sensitive tonight to the leading of the Holy Spirit as he moves in our hearts and he works through the word of God to speak to us as individuals. Lord, I pray you, you'll, be, you'll be honored and pleased with the message this evening. For in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen and amen. I want to ask you a question. Have you, ever, um, have you ever felt like giving up? Have you ever felt so discouraged that you just want to give up? You know, I think about these police officers. That are, they're, they're just under the gun now, so to speak. Uh, and I'm wondering how many of those, those men and women who, uh, who really protect us when we need help uh, are entertaining the thoughts of just giving up that profession. You know, I, can't, I, I think it's like that in almost every profession, in almost every life. 
Sometimes we go through so many valleys in life. We come into contact with so many uh, negative things. Uh, we feel like sometimes we're beating our head, head against the wall or we're not seeing the results that we want to see. And, and we also, uh, we think sometimes about, well, well, is it worth it? What we do, is it really worth it at all? And we entertain the thoughts of, of just giving up. Why, you know, during this pandemic, there are so many people have lost their jobs and they've lost their livelihood and uh, they've lost their ability to support their families and, and they don't see anything positive in the future. And some have even entertained the thoughts of just giving up on this life altogether. And God forbid that anyone would come to that conclusion just to take their life. You know, suicide is a reality in our world today. But uh, I want you to realize that it's a temporary solution. It's just a temporary solution for a permanent problem. And actually, it's a permanent solution for a temporary problem. I should say it that way. It's a permanent solution for a temporary problem because things change. Things do get better. I'm the kind of person, I guess, that um, I like to see the bright side of everything. I'm just like that. I'm just Mr. Positive. Sometimes, uh, you know, it's not good. <laughs> but, but, but I like to, to realize, I, I like to believe that, that there's always hope. There's always something better. Well, in, in our study of the book of Hebrews, uh, you have a group of people there who had embraced a brand new way of, of worshiping God. They had uh, they'd embraced the Lord Jesus Christ and took him as their savior. And they had basically turned their back on the traditions of their fathers, on Judaism and what, what they were raised with, the traditions they were, were used to. And they, they, they've, uh, uh, they've basically uh, placed themselves in the way of a, a new way in Christ. And because of that decision, uh, they began experiencing some very negative things. Uh, some were being persecuted. Some were being ostracized from their families and their loved ones. Uh, some lost jobs. Some, some of their lives were even in jeopardy because of the decision they made to follow Christ. And so like you would, and probably like I would, they were entertaining the thoughts of, well, you know, maybe, maybe I, ma I made a mistake. Maybe I should go back and, and just forget this new way. And so the entire theme to the book of Hebrews was where the writer is trying to convince these believers, don't give up. Don't give up. And he tells them why, and we've studied up to, to chapter 10 the reasons why. He, com he compares the life we have in Christ with the traditions that they had in Judaism. And a key word that runs throughout this book is the word better, better. Well, in chapter number 10, where we find our text this evening, uh, he begins a practical portion of this, uh, this teaching. Uh, and he goes back based upon everything that he's taught beforehand about how Christ is better, how he is our high priest in heaven, and the high priest in heaven in a better sanctuary, a better tabernacle, better than the priest of Aaron and those who offered sacrifices on a daily basis continually because people's sin continually needed to be cleansed. And we learned last week how that the blood of Jesus was shed one time to pay for the sins of all mankind forever, one time. And so he is a forever high priest, uh, and he made a sacrifice one time that was sufficient forever to pay for our, all of our sins. So because of that, we shouldn't give up. We should never give up in this life. And that's the title of the message this evening. If you're taking notes, don't give up. Don't give up. If you haven't found a comfortable spot yet in your house, sit down there and, and look at your phone or your computer screen. Open your Bible with me and turn to Hebrews chapter number 10. Hebrews chapter number 10. And I'm going to preach tonight from one of my most favorite passages in the book of Hebrews because it's on a subject that I can truly identify with. And the subject in view is encouragement encouragement you know when you feel like giving up 
you need to be encouraged, don't you? You really do. You, it, sometimes it's the difference between quitting and staying with it. Somebody encourages you. I know one time my sweet wife worked in uh, social services up in Avery County, and it was a difficult job that she had because it was always changing. The regulations were always changing. She was in the um, AFDC program there, and it was actually a program that, that gave money to people with needs. And, but, but the regulations continued to change, and it was just a headache almost every day. Uh, she had a handbook about that thick that she had to keep, keep adding things and taking things out there. And there were so many times she would come home and she would be just tired of doing that job. And then she would go to work the next day and there would be a card, a note card on her desk from her boss, Marie. And she would open it up and it would have a picture maybe of a little kitty cat hanging on a limb and the word says, hang in there. And you know something? She would stay at that job. Instead of giving it up, she stayed there because somebody encouraged her. Do you ever need encouragement like that? I do. But there's sometimes people just don't come alongside. You know, we become a part of the scenery, and they don't realize that we need to be encouraged. I want you to know, ladies and gentlemen, that there's a way to be encouraged by yourself. You can be encouraged yourself from the Lord. You really can. And so I want to show you how tonight in, in uh, Hebrews chapter number 10, beginning in verse number 19. Hebrews 10, verse 19. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest, the holy place, by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. And having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. For if we sin willfully after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. In verses 19 to 21 of this, this text tonight, uh, one thing that will encourage you is to realize what encouraging privileges you have as a child of God. Verse 19 says that you have a place of access. It says, having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. You see, because of the work of Jesus on the cross of Calvary, we may boldly go where few men have gone before. If I could steal that from Star Trek. It's the Holy of Holies. And there were few men who actually walked into the Holy of Holies. You had to be a great, you had to be a high priest in order to do that. We need to understand what it was like in the Old Testament. And we've spoken about this over the last several weeks where the writer of Hebrews compares uh, great, the great high priest Jesus with the priest of Aaron day, the great, uh, the high priest of, uh, of, of Aaron's day. But just to review a little bit, to be the high priest, he would only enter the Holy of Holies. That was the holiest place in the tabernacle or the sanctuary. It's, it's a place that only the high priest could go, and he can only enter there one time a year. Only after he cleansed himself, and off, only after he made a sacrifice for himself and the people could he go in the Holy of Holies. And even then, his entrance was in fear and trembling. His garments included bells on the fringes so as to let people know that he was still moving around in there and hadn't died because of the Shekinah glory of God. Some say that a rope was attached to his leg so as to pull him out if he died. Uh, no one was allowed in there but him. Few people 
we're able to go into the Holy of Holies. But because you're a child of God today, because you have followed Jesus and taken him on, uh, you know, as your Lord and Savior, you can boldly come before the very presence of God because of him. What a privilege we have to enter into the very presence of God boldly without fear of being rejected, without fear of being dirty, because we've been cleansed by the blood of Jesus. We've been made righteous with his righteousness because we placed our faith in Jesus Christ. Oh my, that's so much better than the priest of old, than the believers of old. So let us not forget thinking about that. Let's not forget the price that was paid for this kind of access to the throne. It says by the blood of Christ. It's only by the blood of our sinless Savior that we can enter the throne room. We enter the throne room in Jesus' name. This new and living way, according to verse 20, was purchased by the blood and body of Jesus. Listen to verse 20. By a new and living way, which he hath consecrated for us, through the veil, that is to say his flesh. The reference to the veil there uh, points back to when the Lord Jesus yielded up his spirit to the Father and his work was done. The veil in the temple was split from the top to the bottom. It's saying that through the veil, Jesus became our great high priest. Now he is our priest in heaven, verse 21, and having an high priest over the house of God. Notice, you can find great encouragement, even if nobody encourages you. You can be encouraged, friend, if you're saved, just by remembering all that you have because you are a child of God, because you are in Christ. If you have your Bibles, look over to Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians 1 and verses 3 through 11. I'm not going to read the passage, but I'm going to summarize some blessings that you have simply because you are in Christ, because he is your high priest. Ephesians 1, 3 says that he has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in Christ. All. Think about that word. It's just a small word, a three-letter word. Think about how Big it really is, all. The Bible says that if you're a child of God, you've been blessed with all spiritual blessings. I'm not so sure that I understand all the spiritual blessings. But I, I understand from that verse that I've been blessed with them. Why? Because I'm in Christ. Verse 4 in Ephesians 1 says that he, he, he chose us in Christ. Almighty God chose us. He handpicked us from before the foundation of the world to be in Christ. Imagine that. You are so important that the God of the universe handpicked you to be in his family. Verse 5 says that he predestinated us to be his sons, his children. If you're saved today, if you're a child of God, you are saved because he chose you to be in his family. What a blessing. Verse 7 in Ephesians 1 says that he redeemed us and forgave us our sins. Amen? He redeemed us. Redeem means to buy back. He bought us back from the slave house of sin. We were in bondage to sin. And he bought us back by paying the price of redemption, his blood, so that we could have freedom in Christ. He redeemed us and he forgave us of all of our sins. Now, that's an awesome statement. We, we say it an awful lot, but we really don't think about the significance of that. Can you remember sins that you've committed in your past? Well, I guarantee you Satan knows what they are. And he'll remind you of them all the time. He's called the accuser of the brethren. But I'll tell you something. When you get saved, he, God takes your sins and he throws them as far as the east and the west. As far as the east is from the west. And he chooses not to remember them anymore. What a blessing it is to be forgiven tonight. And the verse 9 in Ephesians 1 says that he made known unto us the mystery of his will. The mystery in the New Testament is a word that refers to something that was previously hidden 
but that has now come to light. And do you realize, brothers and sisters, that we have light today that the saints of old did not have? We understand some things that the New Testament has revealed that the Old Testament saints were not privy to it as yet. And we're continuing to learn things from the Lord. The mystery of his will. The church itself was a mystery to the Old Testament saints. There never was a time that they could even fathom in their brain that at one time there would only be one entity, the church, made up of Jew and Gentile and every other race, every other people. Uh, one th and, and the church was a mystery. The mystery of the rapture of the church. That was not known to the Old Testament saints. It was foretold by the prophets, but they didn't quite understand it the way we do as New Testament believers. The rapture, the catching away of the children of God before the tribulation period was, was not known to the Old Testament saints. A mystery has been revealed, has been unlocked to us who have embraced Jesus as our Savior. Verse 11 in Ephesians chapter 1 tells us that in Christ we have obtained an inheritance. We have obtained an inheritance. And I'm convinced that we, real, we, we do not and we cannot fathom what that means until we receive it in glory. But we have received an inheritance. What a privilege it is to be a child of God. Isn't that encouraging? When you feel like giving up, when you feel like you're not making a difference in your life, when you don't see an end to things and you find, you find nothing hopeful, go back and remember what you have in Christ. You are a child of God. You have all these blessings, all spiritual blessings right now. You have access to them. What a blessing it is. What a privilege. But you know what I learned a long time ago and what some young people have not yet learned but need to is with privilege also comes responsibility. With privilege, there always comes responsibility. Um, there are some encouraging responsibilities listed in verses 22 to 25. Let's read that. Let us draw near with a true heart, verse 22. In full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water, let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. And let us consider one another to provoke into the love and the good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. You see, we can not only be encouraged by realizing what we have in Christ, we can also be encouraged by what we do. Here's the practical portion, the practical application of the truth we've just learned, what we have in Christ. We have a supreme high priest in heaven that loves us, that's been a human. He's been tempted on all points and yet without sin, so he understands the human condition. And he loves us. He proved his love for us on the cross of Calvary. He paid a price for us that we could not pay for ourselves. His own blood in his body was given as a payment to redeem us, to buy us back from sin. All of these blessings we have because we're in Christ. We can be encouraged by what we have. But what should our response be because of what we have? Well, we can be encouraged by what we do. Dr. McGee shares in these three verses, he says, let us occurs three times. First, it says, let us draw near in faith, verse 23, in faith toward God. Secondly, it says, draw near in hope, that is for ourselves, verse 24. And then draw near in love toward others, in verse 25. So with regards to our worship, with regards to our relationship with God, because of all that we have in Christ. He says, let us draw near to God. And it speaks of our fellowship with God. In faith, we are to draw near to God. Now, when you think about that picture, drawing near to God, 
What comes to your mind? If you were to stand in the very presence of a holy God today, drawing near to him would require a very close examination, wouldn't it? An examination of who we are, being aware of our sins, and of who God is, in that he is faithful and loving and merciful. I mean, if you were to stand before the, the throne of God today, uh, would you not be concerned about yourself and where you stand spiritually? Would you not be concerned about his holiness? You know, every time someone stood face to face with God in the Old Testament, Isaiah fell like a dead man. Peter, when he realized who Jesus was, said, Depart from me, I'm a sinful man, O Lord. You know, when you draw near to God, what will happen is you'll see how very holy he is, how very perfect he is, and immediately your attention will be drawn to your sinfulness. And you'll be saying things like, Who am I? that I should even stand before you? Who am I that I, I, I should even be able to pray to you as holy and perfect as you are? Let us draw near to God in fellowship. He says, with a true heart. Now, many people approach God with the right words, but, with, but without the right heart. A true heart isn't necessarily a good heart, but it means an honest heart before God, one that's open like an open book. It says, let's draw near to God in full assurance of faith. You know, in the same book, Hebrews, over in chapter 11, which we'll get to next week, verse number six says, without faith, it is impossible to please God. Without faith. Uh, believers, we need to remember that, that we're, we're walking by faith and not by sight. In no time is your faith tested more than when you feel like giving up because things are not working around, uh, working right in your life. When you're discouraged, when you've lost courage, you need to be lifted up. And one thing that will lift you up will be your relationship with the Lord. Draw near to him. It's amazing how we find everything else to turn to to get our minds off of what we're dealing with when we need to turn directly to our God because he is our great high priest in heaven. So let's turn to him in full assurance of faith. We come to God on the basis of faith, not doubt. Listen to what James says, James chapter 1, verse number 6. It says, but let him ask in faith. Nothing wavering, for he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with wind and tossed. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. So you have to make a decision. Who are you for? If you're a child of God, draw near to him, not run away from him. Draw near to him when hard times come. Having our hearts sprinkled, it says, our bodies washed with pure water. Now, this has nothing to do with, with believers' baptism. It refers to being saved by the sprinkling of Christ's blood, a picture of what the high priest did in the Old Testament when he sprinkled the blood of the lamb on the mercy seat. When Jesus died on the cross and shed his blood, our great high priest shed his blood for us. So when you're saved, his blood is sprinkled on your account. It also refers to sanctification, wherein the believer allows God to clean up his life. So with regard to our worship, draw near to God. And then with regards to our hope, the next lettuce you see there is let us hold fast the profession of our faith. And listen, it speaks of the hope that we have in Christ. We can hold fast to our profession that Jesus is our Savior and Lord and that he will provide and protect us no matter what obstacle comes our way. We can hold tight to that profession. I love Philippians chapter number one, verse number six. I believe it's one of the most powerful verses in the New Testament on the assurance of your salvation. There it says, being confident 
of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. I love that verse. You see, when we start doubting our salvation, when we don't have the, the hope in our profession of faith that we need, uh, we tend to be looking at our own evidence. We're looking at the way our, our behavior rather than looking at our profession of faith in Christ. And what that says is that God is the one who started the work of salvation in us. We acknowledge that and we believe by faith that Jesus died for us on the cross because that's what the word of God says. It takes faith to believe that. And because we acted on faith and trusted Christ to be our Savior, it says that the work that God started in us, he will perform. He will perform. And how long? It says until the day of Jesus Christ. Until Jesus comes back. God started a work of salvation He'll complete that work of salvation. Hold fast. Hold fast to your profession of faith. It says hold fast without wavering. You see, we cannot afford to let our witness waver. We have to guard our testimony. And when you just give up and you go back to the old ways, it really damages your testimony. And so hold fast to your profession of faith. Be faithful to the finished phase. It says, for he is faithful. Our witness, our testimony depends upon the faithfulness of God working in our lives. We cannot be faithful in and of our own strength. That's why we must draw near to him. We must stay in fellowship with him. And when we do that, we'll have the hope that we need to endure the worst of times. And then he goes on to the third let us in the passage, and, and it has to do with others, other people. Let us consider one another, he says in verse 25, not forsaking, I'm sorry, verse 24. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. Now he's talking to Christians there. He says, we need to consider one another. And not just stand back and, and watch and consider, not observe. What he means is get involved with each other and provoke each other to love and to good works. Now, how do we do that? How do we, how do we provoke other Christians to love and to good works? Well, I believe that one way we do that is when we assemble with each other in the church. Someone asked one time, can you show me a verse in the Bible that says I have to go to church to be a Christian. Well, no, I can't show you a verse that says you have to go to church to be a Christian. I can show you a verse that says you have to go to church to live the Christian life. Because that's, that's found in verse 25. It says not forsaking the assembling of ourselves. When do we assemble together? That's when we attend church together. Not, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as a manner of some is, so some people do, but exhorting one another. And so much the more as you see the day approaching, the day of Christ. Uh, would you say that the coming of Christ is sooner today than it was last week? Absolutely. And if you look at the things going on in our world around us today, it's very obvious to some believers that the coming of Christ may be sooner than we think. And even so, as John said, come Lord Jesus. But the church of Jesus Christ is God's instrument of encouragement. And if you're a child of God and you're not involved in a local fellowship of believers, I'm going to say this and I don't want to hurt your feelings, but for whatever reason you give for it, I want you to remember, you're going to have to answer to God one day for that answer. You don't have to answer to me, but you have to answer to God. I, we have a thousand reasons why we don't need to go to church. Well, it's a human institution. But listen, it is the assembly of God's people. How can I encourage others, other believers, to love and to do good works. How can I do that if I don't spend time with them? And whether it's two or three, he's in our midst. Whether it's 40 or 500, 
wherever the assembly is, if you're a child of God, you need to be involved in a local fellowship. And I know in these difficult days of the pandemic, Many are fearful about meeting in large groups, and I, I certainly understand that. And if that's truly your reason for not coming to the assembly when the doors are open, God knows that, and he, and, and he understands that. There's no problem. But if it is simply because you're lazy and you don't want to get out of bed on Sunday morning and you believe that just watching a sermon on Facebook is, is enough, how can you encourage others to love how can you encourage other believers to do good works if you're not involved with them? The idea here is that we're to consider each other, consider one another. And it refers to the fellowship with other believers in the church. Now, I'll admit that the true emphasis in this verse is not just on church attendance. It is on encouraging one another to be faithful in Christ. Yes, we do need to be faithful in our church attendance, but it is what we do when we attend that is primary. the primary emphasis here. Uh, we are to be an encourager. And I'm fully aware that I can be an encourager to someone by sending them a card in the mail or by picking up the telephone and, and just checking on them to see how they're doing and just by letting them know how, how thankful to God I am for them. Or I can call them and say, I'm praying for you. Or I can just pray with them over the phone. I can send a Facebook message. Those are ways to encourage each other as well. But there's just, it's just not the same sometimes. As, as just meeting in the same room with other believers, seeing the expression on their faces, singing to God, worshiping him together, uh, and, and just enjoying that time of fellowship. I'm so glad that we're able to have services now. Our group is a small group. Uh, I wish it were larger. But, you know, if it were larger, it may not be possible for us to meet all in one room like this. But, but we can, and I'm thankful for that. And I know that back in March and April, when all we were doing was live streaming, that people would chime in all the time saying, I can't wait to be back with my church family. And the doors are open, and they still haven't come back. And so um, God knows. He really does. Uh, what your reasoning is, and there'll be a time when you'll be able to come back and be with us again. I just want you to see from the scriptures the emphasis that God places on believers beating with each other and encouraging each other. And so the church is God's instrument of encouragement. We're to provoke unto love. We're to provoke or stir up love in each other. How can you do that? We're to provoke to good works. We need to encourage each other to do right, do the right thing. We need to cheer each other on to victory, not tear each other apart. No one who truly cares about you would ever want to see you do wrong. They would want to lift you up and encourage you. Not forsaking the assembly, but exhorting, verse 25. And it says even more now that the day is closer than it was. Hebrews 10, 25, and I'll close with this. And, and you take it and, 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 and let the Lord use it how he sees fit. Not forsaking the assembling of yourselves together as a manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Will you pray with me? Father in heaven, we thank you, Lord, tonight for the many blessings that we enjoy simply because we're in Christ. Father, we have so much more than those saints that the writer of Hebrews was writing to. We have much more light, much more information than they had. We have the same Holy Spirit. We have the same God. We trust the same Jesus. And one day in glory, we'll meet these believers face to face. We'll spend eternity talking to them about what they were going through back then and sharing with them what we're going through today. Lord, I'm so thankful that Jesus, my high priest, is in heaven interceding for me and my family and my church family and my loved ones and people that I don't even know. 
And Lord, I'm thankful for the privilege we have to study your word together and that, that the Holy Spirit works in each of our hearts and, and it's like he opens our eyes to see the things that apply to us personally. And Lord, I pray that everything that was said this evening would be taken um, with a spirit of humility. Um, Lord, it was, it's, it's never my intention to, to hurt people. Uh, I do know that the, the truth sometimes hurts. I pray that folks would receive this from one who loves them and who loves the word of God and who wants to be faithful to your word. So Holy Spirit, I pray you would make the application where it belongs. I pray you would use us this week, Lord, to reach out to others, to encourage others for the cause of Christ. I pray that we would uh, not lose hope or not be discouraged because of the valleys that we're in right now, but instead we would look forward to the mountaintop uh, that's just a day away. Thank you for what you're going to do in our life. When we um, begin to obey you, when we begin to spend time with you, to draw near to you, to be more like you, Lord, show us how we can apply these things tonight. For it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Lord bless you folks. Uh, we'll see you Sunday morning.